Hey, I'd like to welcome you to another episode of Mission Matters. My name is Adam Torres, and if you'd like to apply to be a guest on the show, just head on over to missionmatters.com and click on Be Our Guest to Apply. All right, today I have Jacob Frankel on the line, and he's Chair of Government Investigations and Securities Enforcement Practice with law firm Dickinson Wright. Jacob, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Adam. Pleased to be with you. All right, Jacob. So I don't know about you, but uh, I'm getting excited. We're going to Atlantic City Microcap Conference. How about you? We're going to Atlantic City. It looks like we're going to have a great audience and be a chance to meet a lot of folks. And for me, talk about enforcement and some of the risks in this very uh, aggressive, unrelenting enforcement environment that, that we're, in which we're living. Mm, yeah, and I, and I do want to dig deeper into that, especially, you know, for it's, it's been challenging for entrepreneurs just, and service providers, so the, the environment overall. Um, but just to kind of get us kicked off here, I mean, your background, I mean, number one, as, as commentary and otherwise, lots and lots of, of news outlets and otherwise highly, I would say, visible role in SEC enforcement and just the list in your resume. Yeah, you're the guy we want on the show for this. <laughs> I'll just tell you up front. And I'm, uh, and you're doing, are you are you speaking on a panel or are you doing a speech at Microcap Conference? I haven't looked at the agenda quite yet. I, I'm just. Hmm? I'm actually speaking on the first full day of the program wow. uh, for 20 minutes from 3.40 to 4 o'clock. Yeah, I'm going to catch that one because this is this is interesting to me. So in all those, I mean, all the years you've been doing commentary, 20 plus years, CNBC, NBC, Bloomberg, I mean, you name it, Yahoo Finance, you name it. Give me an interesting case or something. I need to I need to hear some of these stories you got. I know over there. <laughs> but the stories are always fun. But probably yeah. the most interesting case I ever discussed on the air, in my view, was the discussion around the, the meme trading and mm. GameStop. And yes, I talked about I mean, what year was that roughly? I'm, I'm trying to remember, but roughly, roughly, do you remember? That was about three years ago, early, yeah. you know, right around COVID. And what made it so interesting to me was this was a phenomenon that we really had not seen in the markets. Mm. The SEC really was not well positioned to to deal with it. I think it got way ahead of the regulators. And you know, as you know, there was a there was a Netflix piece on it. They actually used what a, you know, a clip from one of my CNBC interviews, mm-hmm. but I found that to be one of the more interesting matters on which I had the opportunity and privilege of commenting. Probably one of the more the other interesting ones was the early morning I did with uh, CNBC the day that Bernie Madoff went to jail. I was oh, on. Wow. I'll never forget. I was on for I was on it for 32 minutes with CNBC from mm-hmm. 6:58 till 7:30 talking about you know what was going to happen in court that day and you know what was in front of him but what was in front of him was pretty darn obvious yeah it's a lot it's a lot and so when we think about entrepreneurs when we think about people and now and obviously the at least with bernie madoff obviously that's way on the wrong side of of things that's a given but when i think about things like security when i think about compliance the importance of that and what that means like it's it, it's a lot it's a lot for us to consider and, and especially for those obviously we're not talking about a bernie madoff but those that want to be within regulation right because not everybody that finds themselves on the other side are always like of that kind of nefarious nature, right? I mean, in your experience. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. And in fact, you know, even even people like a Bernie Madoff, mm. they don't start there. But but what I really think happens in those instances is their egos get ahead of them. And once oh, that's they interesting. So of they, it was always my assumption that they kind of started this. That maybe wasn't the original plan. Is that Am I hearing that right? Yeah, I mean, again, that's my take, but I've I've seen that before, yeah. where you know, where successful market participants, particularly on the fund side, mm-hmm. who have been actually producing certain results, you know, they all of a sudden when the when the market turns on them, you know, they realize that they're not prepared to you know to be upfront with what's going on and making the record clean and clear with their clients, and that's when they start doctoring records and. You know, even with WorldCom as an example, you know, you that's mm. probably one of the first examples of the real snowball effect is once it starts, it's hard to you know put that genie back, put that genie back in the bottle. But the challenge for, to me, the challenge, most entrepreneurs want to get it right. And I think the biggest challenge that they face is receiving, surrounding themselves 
with competent, capable advisors who will guide them mm. correctly. And I think the challenge that we have in 2024, we've had for many years, is it is so easy through whether it be social media or just the internet to project expertise. But when, mm -hmm. you know, when things go south, all of those advisors will disappear. And the only person left sort of holding the hand of the entrepreneur ends up being the defense lawyer. Mm. Which makes sense. Yeah, that does make sense. What do you hope that some of the, you know, the conference attendees will get out of your talk and just out of your, what, what you're going to present? Great, great question. Because, you know, I mean, for me, I always want people to, to have a meaningful takeaway from the program. And again, I've been practicing this area now for almost 40 years. And what I'm seeing is an intensity in the enforcement world at an unprecedented mm -hmm. level. I'm finding that in the current environment, you know, many enforcement lawyers, particularly those who do not have inside SEC experience, will even do their clients a, a significant disservice. But the, I want them to take away this is a challenging enforcement environment for entrepreneurs and for the service provider, providers, mm -hmm. because there's very much a focus at the SEC and among the regulators on you know, on the gatekeepers themselves. But for me, the takeaway should be education, understanding the long arm of the SEC and other regulators. And as I mentioned a moment ago, the challenging enforcement environment. Another yeah. is merely raising capital privately, such as the, such as the VC route does not offer mm -hmm. a pass from the regulators. If yeah. somebody's involved in the offer and sale of securities, Federal security laws apply unless there is an exemption. So it, mm. it really is about coming away with a sense of if you want to play by the rules, be prepared really to do so and recognize the environment that you're in, the stakes in which you're playing. As I often tell clients you know, who get that SEC subpoena, it's like mm. if you're playing in this space, that is a risk, but it's something that can be managed. Yeah. Who is when you think about this this mindset and when you sit in this risk, like who shares in this risk? Because there's there's a whole infrastructure, right? I I, I really think it's all the participants. M many years ago, it was it, the focus was just on the issuers, and the officers, the officers and directors, but that yeah. has changed considerably. I mean, it's the issuers, it's the officers and directors, mm -hmm. but it's also the investor relation firms public mm -hmm. relations firms, the capital raisers, registered and unregistered. The SEC is big on bringing cases against unregistered yeah. broker-dealers. And there's even a focus on the gatekeepers. When I say gatekeepers, I'm talking about the lawyers. You know, the lawyers who write, you know, who, who will write opinions, auditors, I mean, yeah. underwriters, transfer agents, anybody who mm -hmm. falls into the gatekeeper category. And as I mentioned a moment ago, you know, what happens is when the regulators come knocking and the news starts tightening, Mm -hmm. That fully supportive circle of the auditors who've been there working with the client, with the issuer client, the lawyers mm -hmm. who were working on the transactions and giving advice, well, they're going to run away from that sloppy audit because now they have exposure. The lawyers who mm -hmm. botched the transaction documents, you know, are going to, you know, are going to say, well, it was really the client. So yeah. that supportive circle collapses. And do you think, and this is, again, just, you know, I don't know if it's a fair question because there may not be one answer, a right or wrong answer, but in general, do you think that evolution just came from, like, you know, some of the, obviously the big things that have happened when, and, and just an evolution of the of regulation and compliance, just understanding that, hey, there has to be, you have to go further down the chain to kind of make sure this stuff doesn't happen again. Like, just your opinion, like, how did that evolution take place? Adam, I think you, I think you hit it on the head because I was having a conversation. Yeah, hey, I got lucky on that one. I don't always do that. I don't always do that one, Jacob. Go ahead, please tell me more. No, no, you, no, you, no, you, no, you, you, you nailed it because I mean I was in conversation the other day with a number of former enforcement directors of the SEC as well as the current director, and part of that conversation is how is it that we got to where we are right now, and yeah. you know, and and actually. The second director of the enforcement division, just to give a little bit of a story, 
Stanley mm-hmm. Sporkin is a legend in the enforcement world. In the Lincoln Savings case in the early 1980s, I mean, he coined the line, where were the professionals? Where are the lawyers? In mm-hmm. other words, where are the people who are presumed to have that responsibility you know, yeah. to make sure that everybody is protected in the transactions? And I think the regulators over time have recognized that while the enforcement initiative against those on the front line, meaning the issuers themselves or Mm -hmm. the the capital raisers, are responsible for the communications. The question is, who else around them has culpability? Who's responsible? And actually, when we talk about gatekeepers, I did not mention, I should have mentioned, compliance officers. Because compliance officers, too, potentially have liability. It's not the fact that the person is a lawyer or is an auditor or is a compliance officer. Mm -hmm. It's did did they, in their role as a gatekeeper, do what they were supposed to do? And Mm. I think the the enforcement mindset has evolved to to one of these are all deterrent messages that the regulators need to be sent. And now on the auditing side, you also have the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board. And to complicate everything, you now have a whistleblower program that is extremely active at the SEC, mm-hmm. that the SEC uses to generate cases, you know, provides whistleblower bounties. So the mm-hmm. SEC essentially incentivizes participants mm-hmm. in frauds or victims of fraud or identifiers of fraud to come forward. Man. I'm kind of smiling because I'm wrapping my head around that. I'm like, that sounds like capitalism mixed with democracy mixed with, I mean, there's just so much, that's such a complex, but it makes sense when you say it to me intuitively, it's like, yeah, we want to, we obviously one side of the coin, whether it's nefarious or intentional or inept or whatever it is, I'm not going to like act like I know every scenario, but if we're, if one side's incentivized by the standpoint of whatever it was, the ego, money, whatever it was, then the other side should be incentivized too, right? Like if there's those two things on each shoulder, like, hey, can the good side be incentivized a little bit? I'm not against that. Hmm. Well, but, but to go beyond that, Adam, you know, there was one word yeah. in, in, in your in your comment that actually I want to draw out for a second because it also ties mm-hmm. back to your question a moment ago, which is democracy. And that yeah. is one of the other dynamics is which administration is in power. No, mm. is it a democratic administration or a yeah, public administration? Point. Because that also impacts who is the chairman of the SEC, and the chair yeah. of the SEC chooses who is the director of the of enforcement, and that very much sets the culture and temperament of enforcement that's very much in play, and that applies to the Department of Justice as well. Mm. And I mean, it's interesting to hear you say that because I think some of the people that, you know, that listen to this show and uh, myself included, I'm hosting the show. Like sometimes we think these things, but we don't always have affirmation from the people that are that are, you know, in the mix, making it happen and actually doing the work. Right. So you being in that type of meeting and working on these types of cases and things like that, like that's. That to me is at least gratifying from, well, gratifying in many ways, but I mean from the standpoint of knowing that there's people out here working really hard trying to figure some things out to make the system better, right? Like we're not, we're not complacent or stagnant. <laughs> we're, we're trying. Right. And they are. And, and I think, you know, I really have had the, the privilege of being on both sides. I mean, I spent yeah. the first 14 years of my career on the government side. So I was mm-hmm. in a position of bringing those cases, participating in those discussion, discussions, considering whether there's a, policy justification to bring or not to bring the case. And now as a defense lawyer, you know, I have the benefit of having spent all those years on the on the government side. But at the same time, you know, the role is not necessarily to, you know, as people often say, get someone off. It's, yeah, it's yeah. to make sure that there is a balanced, rational decision, one that permits and enables someone to continue in business, continue with their life with minimal disruption. Mm. And of course, there are cases that are sufficiently egregious where you know, we defense lawyers then have to you know, go into our, you know, our litigation toolbox and, yeah. you know, and play aggressive defense lawyer. But v- most SEC cases, most regulatory cases settle, although the regulators are making it much more difficult given mm. the draconian positions they're taking in their 
settlement demands. So more and more we're seeing cases at least starting in the courts and being in front of a an independent arbiter, meaning a judge, before a case actually can get into a meaningful settlement posture. Hmm. Something you mentioned to me, it's kind of curious. So because you've been on both sides, do you feel that gives you an, an advantage like for your clients? Because you've seen both sides. I feel like that's not, is that, I don't think that's always a common experience, the amount of, especially the other side on the government side for you to have that much experience. The answer is yes. I, I do think it is a, it is a true differentiator for a number of, mm-hmm. number of reasons. One is <clears throat> I know them, they know me, you know, both yeah. substantively reputation, they know that I speak the language. I understand the process and know mm-hmm. exactly how they think. And I actually think the first question that a someone should ask a defense lawyer, someone who might be defending an SD investigation or a PCO, PCOB investigation is, did you work for the SEC? In which office? Because mm. I really have found myself cleaning up, I hate to say it, cleaning up messes that other lawyers have created for clients because of and their lack of familiarity with the yeah. process, despite their projecting it. Now, to be clear, I'm not a transactional lawyer, but what mm-hmm. I do is I work closely with the transactional lawyers in my firm on the governance and risk management issues, and I leave to them the mastery of creating capital growth opportunities for clients, which they do you know, extraordinarily well, but at the same time, that's the role of the transactional lawyer, I keep my focus on the governance, the risk management, and the defense of the investigations. Hmm. Well, Jacob, I know I know we just uh, scratched the surface here today, but and I'm looking forward to learning much more when I see, come see your talk over at Microcap Conference. That being said, if somebody wants to continue the dialogue or you know has some more questions and wants to explore the work over at Dickinson Wright, I mean, what's the best way for them to do that? Well, it's always a pleasure, and I'm always willing to do that. Certainly, I will make time and I'll be at the conference for one-on-one conversations, even about investigations or perceived imminent investigations, but to contact me directly, my Mm. telephone at the office is 202-466-5953. My email is jfrankel, J-F-R-E-N-K-E-L at Dickinson. Right, D I C K I N S O N W R I G H T dot com. But I'm also on LinkedIn and what I've had the, the privilege of doing pretty easy to find on, you know, on internet search engines. Mm. And uh, are you also going to be available for help with poker playing, Jacob? <laughs> 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 At an Atlantic City. <laughs> Because I need help, man. I've been doing all these interviews, and I feel like I'm going into the water with all the sharks, man. I'm like, I'm, once you tell somebody you're not good, you're invited to everybody's game. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that how popular you get? <laughs> One of the things I've learned, and as somebody who has been and is, and is currently an expert witness, is I like hmm. to stay in my lane. So <laughs> I personally believe I need to follow you and bring along bring, and and share that expert. <laughs> Who's going to be with us? It will not be I who will be that expert. <laughs> oh, that's 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 exactly the answer I'd expect from us <laughs> from compliance. Thank you so much, Jacob. <laughs> and to the audience, hey, if you haven't hit that subscribe button yet, I don't know what you're waiting for. We got compliance in the line, man. <laughs> hit that subscribe button. <laughs> Thanks so much, Jacob, for coming Adam, on. Adam, thank you very much for the opportunity. Pleasure speaking with you.